So I'm okay to start now then. Can you all hear me if I speak like that? Okay. Four lions is made in Sheffield and it's just like the steel. And therein lies a fundamentally flawed problem with the 9-11 Commission report and the Pentagon narrative on Islamic extremism. Sheffield Forge Masters, Sheffield Forge Masters, now coral steel, know full well the burning kerosene can't melt steel. It's just not hot enough. Well, whatever the entertainment industry would have us believe about generation jihad, Muslims did not do 9-11. It's that plain and simple. Now, unlike the picture of Islam, painted by the dark film satire, Four Lions, it was meant to be funny. And I know from experience that the Islam preached by every true prophet and messenger of Almighty God is based on peace. Salam. Shalom coupled with truth and justice. Therefore, peace be with you all. Salam. Alakayun. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's flip it, shall we? Let's flip it to George W. Dot Bush. He'd say something like this. Well, thanks for inviting me. And those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. And let us not tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. And nothing more than Satan's weapons of mass deception. Antichrist systems notwithstanding, in the course of this presentation, I want to convince you of three things. Firstly, an understanding of the events that have shaped the last decade in the UK is predicated not so much on facts to be learned, but on secrets to be discovered. Secondly, men and women become accomplices to the evil they fail to oppose. And thirdly, the price men and women pay for their indifference to public affairs is that they become ruled by evil men. Now on the subject of 7-7 itself, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, and if you just move on a few slides now please, I'll just go through the slides. And the next one please. And stop that. On the subject of seven itself, former Prime Minister Blair said on that fateful day, we know, we know this was done in the name of Islam. In stark contrast, the Tony who stands before you today sees it very differently. I say categorically that the 7-7 London bombings were not perpetrated by Muslims. They were in fact inside jobs perpetrated by agents of the state with media connections and blamed, blamed on innocent Muslim patsies and successive UK governments covered up the dreadful truth. The 7-7 atrocities were only done in the name of Islam insofar as the UK satanic state apparatus needed some catastrophic event so that it could blame Islam and dampen down opposition to their own evil role as the carefully disguised aggressors in the Middle East. As it was foretold by the project for the new American century and the grand chessboard by Zbigny Brzezinski, Islam had to be blamed so that the Middle East resources could be plundered 
without stoking up public outrage on grounds of immorality. No big deal. Prime Minister Blair was only standing shoulder to shoulder with President George Bush. We have just got to hunt down Osama bin Laden. Now the truth is, if you just move on the slide. Because the ladies can't hear you. The ladies can't hear. Can we just move on a slide then, please, I should. Okay, that's fine, that's fine, leave it on there for the time being. The truth is that 7-7 has all the hallmarks of an inside job and was a stage-managed horror show perpetrated not by four Muslims, not my four Muslim lads from Beast and Leeds, but by the intelligence services, with all the white might of its controlling media tentacles in order to brainwash the nation into believing Islamic extremists are a huge threat to our freedoms. These Satanists boasted to the mantra of outright terror, bold and brilliant. Outside Canary Wharf, headquarters of HSBC Bank, on the 7th of July 2005, two or possibly three young Muslim lads were in all probability assassinated. Most certainly, they were not responsible for simultaneously blowing up the three trains and then a number 30 bus. They did not kill 52 innocents. They did not blast themselves to smithereens. One of the lads, she says Tenguia, did not end up in 52 pieces while the person sat the other side of his supposedly detonated rucksack walked away relatively unscathed. No reliable evidence could place them at the crime scene. Fact. They were set up as patsies. Unwilling. The powers that be, if you just move on a slide, please. Okay. So there's the four lads. There's the four lads that uh, took the blame. If you move on another slide, please. The powers that be were having a laugh at everyone's expense. To quote from Hitler, the bigger the lie, the greater propensity for the public to believe it. Tony Blair, Jack Straw, Sir Ian Blair told us a great big lie and the, new, the duped nation by and large bought it, hook, line and sinker. Next slide, please. Justice with courage. I'll repeat that. Justice with courage. That was the mantra of South Yorkshire Police, my employers, for 17 years. For doing my job properly, South Yorkshire Police inflicted injustice without courage on their own principal intelligence analysts. SYP, South Yorkshire Police, failed to walk their talk. Next slide, please. But if South Yorkshire Police could not care less about their own professional standards for honesty and integrity, on the 2nd of September 2010, the day I was dismissed, the message from the word for today on my dismissal could not have been more apt. Almighty God cares about honesty in the workplace. Next slide, please. Being in the matrix. My assignment was to produce a matrix, a strategic threat assessment, a reduced number crunching exercise that showed management, South, you know, chief constables, where resources should lie, where the threats were and what the risks were across a range of criminality. Being awoken to the fact that 9-11 and 7-7 were not perpetrated by 23 Muslim suicidal maniacs, then 
a full five years it took me to wake up to that fact. And I woke up first about 9-11. Uh, and that turned my world upside down as somebody who'd had 17 years service in the police service. For the best part of a decade, I had been employed as the principal intelligence analyst of South Yorkshire Police. And I'd an unwit I'd, I had unwittingly and unquestioningly bought the monstrous lie that it was the Muslims that simultaneously hijacked the passenger airlines, defeated the most sophisticated defence systems on the planet, pulverised the twin, twin towers to dust, penetrated the Pentagon with, with a plane flown with perfect precision, precision and plummeted a jet airliner into the fields of Pennsylvania, leaving not a shred of debris in the wake of the crash scene. We have been duped into swallowing the yarn that 9-11 was orchestrated by Al-Qaeda and a leader named Osama bin Laden, previously known as Tim, who had close family links with the Bush family and was, while suffering from ill health, fully able to successfully evade capture from the CIA for the best part of a decade by hiding out in the caves of Pakistan and Afghanistan. There's a saying that truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it becomes violently opposed. And finally, it becomes self-evident. From my vantage point, as a former principal intelligence analyst, I can see now the matrix construct I was in, in the police service, more clearly. And when I saw it, when I got kicked out of the police force, speaking truth to power, I showed the matrix system to the Employment Appeals Tribunal in London and the Court of Appeal and the Royal Court of Justice. Just exactly what the matrix looked like when applied to all sorts of criminality within the police service. None dare look at my analysis. The judges skirted around the issue so as to not to have to consider the facts. One acronym best describes the characteristics of the strategic threat assessment matrix and the matrix system imposed on the police service by the National Police Improvement Agency, or I would prefer to call it the National Police Indoctrination Agency. And that acronym is INET. INET standing for I for invalid, N for nonsensical, E for evasive, P for pleasing to the eye. That's the one thing that they were good at. These matrices look pretty and colourful. And finally, T, tarnished. Tarnished in as much as the practitioners who had to construct these matrices, namely intelligence analysts and particularly principal intelligence analysts, quickly woke up to the fact that they were unfit for purpose, they were ludicrous. But a few of my counterparts in other police forces had the courage to oppose them as a construct. Now, I'm not saying that all threat assessment matrices, for instance, in the police, were automatically bad. But applying the matrix to the threat from terrorism, applying the matrix system on the threat from terrorism purely on the basis of what the government Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre told us about the threat was, for me, the final straw that broke the camel's back once 9-11 and 7-7 were clear to me that they were inside jobs. And that's how I saw it. Now, if you just move on, I'm going to right now just show you some examples of the matrix construct that we were dealing with and how it was all simplified. I mentioned pretty. The police liked the colourful traffic-like systems. But everything was reduced down to a number, Orwellian style. Everything was reduced to nonsensical percentages. Right? And the idea behind it was to give a distorted and skewed picture as to what the threat was. And invariably we were told by the Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre that the threat from an Islamic terrorist attack was imminent and that the position was critical and severe. 
And as analysts, we weren't given any intelligence analysis to verify whether that was the case. We had to take that as the truth. Score it up in a matrix system that is totally invalid statistically, and my first degree was statistics. And that this had the effect of always skewing and distorting the threat that was reported back to the very agency that was perpetrating and, and, and talking about the threat in the first place. So here we had a circular thing that was, to all intents and purposes, demonising Muslims without the evidence. And certainly in the light of 9-11 and 7-7, because all the assumptions that I'd ever held were, were grounded in the belief that initially it was the Muslims that did it. So when I woke up, the whole matrix system was invalidated and the whole counter-terrorism strategy that went by the name of contest suddenly, to my eyes, became putrid and vile and unacceptable. Can we just move on the slide? Next one. It was always all about exaggerating and stoking up the climate of fear. All pretty colourful tables. And the same dumbed down process was coming from MI5. They had a, a five gate system, a five bar system, a Likert scale system. But invariably it was always, as I say, critical or severe. We can expect an attack any time. Next slide, please. And the Metropolitan Police put out marketing to create a climate of fear where we had the community, you know, fear within the community to ridiculous levels. And when chip shop owners in Scarborough are asked to do a health and safety assessment with respect to the risk from terror, it gives a whole new meaning to the expression about fish getting battered. <laughs> this was to make preparation to treat a generational infection of young jihadists, which according to Sir Norman Bettison, the fallen chief constable, head of ACPO Prevent Strategy, he was the one on BBC Generation Jihad that went out and said, the infection of Islamic terrorism requires treatment that's going to last for 20 years, all supported by a BBC programme. Next slide, please. And the idea behind all of this is to erode your civil liberties by creating that climate of fear and suspicion to justify the war on terror and in order to grab what our state considers our oil beneath their sand, referring to the Middle East. Next slide, please. Aided by an utterly complicit, controlled media, held bent on suppressing the truth in an attempt to fill the masses. Welcome to Police State UK. This was health and safety gone berserk. This was Orwellian, George Orwell, 1984. Next slide, please. At least when they sacked me, didn't say I was wrong. They said my views could be correct. They were quite respectful. They even said I could be useful for the police service when they chucked me out. They said I'd had an exemplary service. But after the police chucked me out of the organisation, I appealed to the internal process, which is the police authority. And that uh, they're supposed to referee between me and the police and be independent. But they just completely were subjective 
and took the view that my views were outlandish, even though the police themselves had never said that. They said my views could be correct, but it's not where the police said to me, my, my bosses said, it's just incompatible with where we are today. And that you may be right, but you know, they couldn't do anything. But when it gets to the next stage up, we get that view that this is an outlandish conspiracy theory. This is basically a nutter standing before you. Back to those matrices and the climate of fear. Gone was the commandment, was love thy neighbour, but in police state UK, this was all about spying on your neighbour. That's what we were being taught to do. It went under a banner of rich picture, the prevent strategy, where we were collecting information and intelligence, specifically targeting Muslims, specifically targeting Muslims in the mosques and also in university campuses. And don't worry, keep calm, was the carry on, was the insipid message put out by the Metropolitan Police to rekindle a misplaced Churchillian spirit against what they, by deceit, wanted us all to see as the common, en common enemy, young jihadists and mad mullahs. This was the kind of insipid climate that was building up on the back of the wrongs of 9-11 and 7-7, where you've been falsely blamed. So this spying on the Muslims was referred to as rich picture. They were gathering the intelligence on the Muslims and we introduced business metrics, performance indicators, counting how many intelligence logs we had on you. And we had targets against those. Meanwhile, next slide please. So that's the counter-terrorism strategy. And essentially, we're talking about the prevent strategy at this case, in this moment in time. One of the four arms of it. The next, next slide please. I saw it somewhat different, the four Ps that they put out. This was pursue the Muslims, prevent, pretend it's the Muslims, petrify, it's perverse and power crazy, and prepare, plunder their oil. This is what we are being ruled by. Next slide, please. Next slide after that, and the next one. The rich picture of gathering intelligence, the next slide after that. So, BBC Generation Jihad. The BBC skew and distort the terror threat picture and heighten people's fear among young, jihadic, young radical jihadists while they largely ignore all the good interfaith dialogue and the community initiatives show Muslim, Muslims in a positive light within the community. Where do we see that by the BBC? We don't. Next slide, please. But we create insensitive films. And whether you feel as though they're funny or not, they are inappropriately stereotyping young Muslims. Next slide, please. And we get the gutter press to humiliate at every opportunity. Next slide. And the slide after that. And we go to any lengths to show that the government's contest strategy was working. And we're quick to tell the public how many plots, like 7-7, they claim to have foiled. But can we trust anything they say? Can we trust anything they tell us? Note well on that headline, which was last week, their use of the word seven. They foiled seven plots since seven seven. We get the Sun newspaper. Next slide, please. We get the Sun newspaper to endorse the right Tony. Next slide, please. But ridicule the wrong Tony. 
when he stood up and spoke truth to power. Next slide, please. Now, while most people acknowledge the limitations of reading the Sun newspaper, fewer people suspect the integrity of the BBC's flagship investigative programme, Panorama, when there is demonstrable proof that police commission, commissioners have blatantly lied about 7-7 and about the assassination of Jean-Charles de Menzies. Sorry, are you trying to get my attention? Sorry. What right have they, Panorama, to be critic and the commissioners to be critical of the Muslim Council of Britain? Jeremy Paxman and Gavin Hessler notwithstanding, Panorama need investigating and overhauling, as does, I suggest, the whole of the BBC. Now, there's a gentleman who's filming today called Tony Rook. You ought to have a word about him about the BBC because he's withheld on the Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act his BBC licence fees because he's calling them complicit in the cover-up of terrorist activity and the distorting of the truth on terrorism. And he had an interesting case last week. Next slide, please. Warranting immediate arrest is the man of crisis, or should I say ISIS? Because if ever there was someone who needed to be arrested over 7-7, here is your man, Peter Power, visor consultants, terror drill specialist extraordinaire, and the front man often for the BBC whenever the government sponsored terror threat propaganda machinery goes into full throttle. Check him out on Terror on the True. He was the guy heading up on the day a terror drill exercise that was occurring at precisely the same locations at precisely the same locations where the bombs went off on the underground. Subsequently started to retract somewhat. His latest um, defence of the situation was this was a mere back office of only a few of his staff. Incorrect, because on the fifth anniversary of the London bombings just before I got the sack and made my stance, my boss, a DCI at the time, admitted candidly that he was down on a terror drill exercise on the London bombings on the day itself. Well, either there was some other terror drill exercise going on, or we had detective chief inspectors from other police forces part of that terror drill exercise. It all points to massive lies and cover-up. Next slide, please. The, the strategy of lie and deny is tried and tested. It worked for the Third Reich, and it's working for the Fourth. The Fourth Reich, the New World Order. It's vile, but it's well recognised and proven to work. Just read what Hermann Goring had, had to say on it. So next slide, please. Muslims have been demonised, and you don't need to take my word for it. There's plenty of research out there as to what's happening to the Muslims with respect to the counter-terrorism strategy known as contest. There are countless injustices against Muslims since 9-11 in our country. There are untold number of examples of terror bomb hoaxes and false flag attacks. And here are just a few reminders. Time won't permit me to go through them all, so I'm just going to really show you some photographs. So forgive me while I pause for a breath as I go through some self-evident examples. So we just move, first slide, the racing plot in 2003 that never was. Move on to the next slide, please. We have, with the Iraq war, an admittance by the former MI5 boss that Iraq did not pose a threat to us. But when does she admit that? She didn't admit that when she was in, employed as MMI5, when she should have intervened and said that. She admitted it many years later, after, the, after it had bolted. Next slide, please. Weapons of mass destruction. Almost certainly. He was, you know, for being a whistleblower, for telling the truth, for having a conscience and speaking out against the injustice of what our country was doing, he lost his life. He did not commit suicide, almost certainly. Next slide, please. Paintballing is not a crime. 
Here we have Mohammed Hamid, supported by the BBC, sent on a, an exercise up in the Lake District in order to trap him so that they can throw terrorist offences at him for doing little more than going and paintballing. He was speaking out, he was exposing the untruth of 9-11 and 7-7. That's why he was singled out and targeted and now he's currently in a long-term prison sentence where his daughter, Yasmin Cass, is doing a level best to actually heighten awareness as to the gross injustice of Hamid, right? Mohammed Hamid. He was speaking out about what really is behind all this. He was speaking about the secret societies that bind the politicians, the police service and the judiciary together to create the levels of corruption that, will, that are within our midst. Next slide, please. And the next, please. Rizwan Sabir. I've met Rizwan a number of times. Very articulate chap. He was a PhD student at Nottingham University. His crime? He downloaded open source information on the CIA website. Some information that was available for anybody. Wouldn't he? Because he was doing a PhD on terrorism. It's a natural thing to do. Did absolutely nothing wrong. But the police came in and arrested him and put him in prison for six days. And then, when his tutor, next slide please, when his tutor, Rod Thornton, came to his rescue and his defence, saying this is unjust, this is outrageous, he was made a pariah. And he was kicked out of the university too. Next slide please. And the next please. So, we come to London bombings and we, we will go through some analysis in a short time. Next slide after that please. And the next. We have so-called corroborators of the four parties that were set up for the London bombings. But these were subsequently cleared, not without some help from a gentleman called Moad Dim. Next slide, please. And then we have another patsy set up on um, 2009, the Underpants Bomber. But that was a CIA-related incident, and this was a set-up patsy. Read 9-11 and uh, Webster Tarpley to know more. Next slide, please. And then, for coming to the aid of three corroborators at the Kingston trial, Moad Dib made a film of 7-7 Ripple Effect, a brilliant expose of what really happened. And if you haven't seen it, I would recommend anybody go Google Ripple Effect 7-7 and, and the work of Moad Dib. And he sent, seeing the injustice against the Muslims, he sent a copy of his DD to the clerk of the court. And to cut a long story short, there's nothing wrong with doing that in law, but for doing that, he faced 151 days, ultimately, in prison, which happened, just coincidentally, to coincide with the Lady Justice Hallett inquiry into the London bombings. They kept him inside because he was too dangerous, because he was courageous enough to speak out. He was brilliant enough, mind-wise, to expose what was really going on with the London bombings, and they had to keep him quiet. Next slide, please. What did I do then? When I, when, in, in my moment of choice, on the fifth anniversary of the London bombings, I've suddenly woke up. The next day I'm supposed to present to the Chief Constable saying that the threat's coming from Islamic terrorism. I'd alerted them the day before saying, we've got a problem here. Houston, we have a problem. If you look on the internet, there's all sorts of information pointing towards that it was an inside job. And that... we. we that in itself is going to cause great community tension if we don't do something about it. They wanted me to sort of ignore my, my reservations and go along with a lie. So on that anniversary, I decided I had to make a stance. So I went in on the morning where my assignment was due in front of the Chief Constable and basically bastardised all the scoring system and said that the threat 100% is coming from within and scored everything else 
as totally irrelevant. In other words, I was saying, the only thing that matters here is the truth. Don't ask me to lie for you. For that, if you just next slide. So I said that the threat comes from within, internal tyranny. And that every other type of criminality they wanted me to score up was totally irrelevant in that context. Next slide, please. And in the control strategy that sets the activity of the police and determines where our resources should be, I simply said everything's irrelevant until we get to really behind what's behind 9-11 and 7-7 because it just invalidates everything that I'm doing and I'm not lying for you. Next slide, please. So for that, they asked me to write a report and explain myself. They removed me from the office and I call the report a rich picture of an ignoble lie or enabling the one truth. And I said, in terms of what I would do, I made some inferences. So if you just move on the slide. Basically, I wrote down in front of the boss that 9-11 was a false flag, at a probability assessment of 99% certain. 7-7 was a false flag op operation, with a probability assessment as better than 95% certain. I said that the War in Afghanistan and Iraq was immoral and based on false pretenses. And that I went further. I said that the multitude had been fooled and that it was based on ungodly corruption and evil within our midst. And it was based on a new world, a satanic new world order that was being implemented. And I put a probability assessment on that. So the next slide, please. And in terms of explaining what I did and why I felt compelled to make a stance and basically commit professional career suicide, I said, I mentioned that my role as a principal intelligence analyst was not a spin doctor. I was not your Alistair Campbell. I'm there to tell the truth without fear or favour. Next slide, please. And I basically explained to my bosses, I implored them to take action. And I put the emphasis on them to investigate. And I offered them a full report, which they would refuse to look at and to accept. Next slide, please. I talked about my religious beliefs about the fact that the Ninth Commandment compelled me to speak truth and not bear falseness, false witness against my neighbour. In this instance, in this context, my neighbour was Muslims. And that I was, as an analyst, assigned to, a, to, they wanted my opinion on the threat, I had to give it honestly, or not at all. And although they wanted me to squirt down, skirt around the issue, my faith compelled me that, no, I can't lie. I've got to tell it as it is, as I see it. They were paying me to give the analysis. It wasn't somebody else's analysis, it was my analysis. So there was no way I could skirt around the issue. Conscience wouldn't permit it. Next slide, please. So, you probably read faster there, but I was imploring them to take action. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I used some slides just to show that I had information that I was aware of the kind of secret societies and how this was all binding together. So I'll just move on some slides and show you the kind of thing that I used. The all-seeing eye, the one eye, the evil eye, the insignia on MI5. No coincidence. Next slide, please. And the next slide, that's the MI5. I really set a challenge for South Yorkshire Police by putting to them the question, because two, two or three weeks prior to this, we were being heralded in the press for arresting a drunken, guy, a drunken student in Sheffield that was urinating over the war memorials. And everybody was patting the back of South Yorkshire Police for doing a good job in, in, in doing a simple arrest, as if that was good policing. The guy in a drunken stupor, was very remorseful. 
So I was saying, making the point, well, who is really pissing, and pardon my language, but on all on those that gave their lives for freedom. I saw it in those terms because by that time I'd already got clear indication that the police were not going to do anything regarding investigating the criminality that I was alleging that was taking place and the corrupt practice that was there within the police service. By right, I was their analyst. They were obliged to investigate my alleged criminality. They certainly shouldn't have sat me. Next slide, please. In addition to all the empirical evidence and, and, and believing that 7-7 was an inside job on the basis of my data analysis, I was interested in the kind of end-time Bible prophecy. And I showed them the kind of patterns that were available from biblical scripture and from new, biblical numer numerology. And there's no shortage of information available the talk um, uh, that should have preceded this may well, in talking about the Dejal, touched on some of these issues. They run very parallel with each other. Next slide, please. And I handed over, on the day of my dismissal, I handed over to them clear reports that were clearly showing what this new world order agenda was all about. So they couldn't see and couldn't deny that they had this information in front of them. Next slide, please. So this is the kind of material I dropped on their table on the day that they dismissed me. Next slide, please. When I took this to the court after it had been thrown out, my legal advice was to fight this on my religious philosophical belief regulations. What they perhaps should have done is fight it on a public interest disclosure. In other words, I was making an allegation, they were duty bound to investigate. South Yorkshire police are on record, they never once investigated. My problem, if it was a problem, maybe it was just the way it was meant to be, but I pursued this case initially on the grounds of my religious belief, on the grounds that I was, one, obliged to tell the truth because of my Christian beliefs as a witness, and secondly, because I'd said that the threat, rather than coming from Islamic terrorism, uh, Islamic, Islamic extremism, sorry, it was coming from a satanic new world order, an ideology underpinned by Freemasonry and secret societies that followed a, an antichrist, a satanic ideology. I said that. Now, the legal team det determined in their wisdom that that was possibly the best way of winning a case. Because if you've got a religious belief and you're sacked for that religious belief, that's unlawful. So. The, the, the case proceeded in the courtroom, a very interesting court case in this, in, at this time, based on an argument as to whether my belief was philosophical or religious or not, and if it was, I would have been protected. Now, just to tell you why I lost that argument, the judge said to me, well, had you not disbelieved the government narrative on 9-11 and 7-7, would you have been able to complete the matrix to the satisfaction of your employers? And the answer I had to say, hold my hand up and say, yes, it was 9-11 and 7-7 that ultimately tipped me to make the stance. Irrespective of the fact that I was aware of the New World Order and its satanic ideology, that wouldn't have been sufficient for me to, to make the stance. It was when, through empirical data and observation and reading, that that made me make the stance. So that wasn't philosophical. So I lost that particular argument. So I lost all openings to a discrimination case. But I do want to show you one or two things I'd said in front of the courts regarding my religious philosophical beliefs. So if you just, um, I said I believe Satan is at work in the high degrees of Freemasonry and he is behind the Vatican and the Jesuits and like a Trojan horse has also infiltrated the Protestant church. All are synonymous with the new world order whose ascent is a fulfillment of end time prophecy. Next slide, please. I talk about the morality. So this is all philosophical, because I believed it was morally wrong for our Western governments to be at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. A global fall of law enforcement that unnecessarily kills thousands of innocent people to punish or prevent crimes for which they bear no responsibility is, to my mind, plain and simple wrong. 
So this was the kind of arguments I was putting forward in terms of my religious philosophical beliefs. Next slide, please. I said that the New World Order, it's, it's, this ideology is warmongering. I said it's a direct attack on Islam. It's also a direct attack on Bible, true Bible-believing Christianity. This was all about the obliteration of both faiths, as I saw it, this New World Order. So taken as a whole, um, you know, the, the, what I was saying is that this is a massive issue, and that it was, in a way, philosophical. Now, this was all the, all, all the argument that ultimately I lost. Next slide, please. And we'll move on again. So that was the, uh, 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 there was 96 points I made, 95 points I made in my religious philosophical belief statement. And speaking to the chaplain of South Yorkshire Police, he said that this had been around all to chief constables and caused a massive ripple effect. I was calling them out. I was calling the secret societies out here that were underpinning the corruption. Um, but my case, because it failed on that, it went forward in a different light. I tried to resurrect the case on the argument that I was making a protected disclosure. I was, should have been protected on the Public Interest Disclosure Act. In other words, I was alleging against the police criminality. So I, to some extent, I had an, a second chance to appeal. And this is where the data analysis comes out about the London bombings and the 9-11 because my religious philosophical belief statement that was in the court in the first instance hardly mentioned 9-11 and 7-7. So I'm just going to now give you a flavour of the kind of analysis that was in front of the Royal Court of Justice as to why I, as an analyst trained, could not believe in 9-11 and 7-7. And I'm just going to focus on 7-7 a little bit to show you the methodology of what I did. So if you just move down a few slides, that was the information that's available for anybody if you, uh, on 9-11. And now we get to 7-7. And this was a quite a lengthy document, around about 30 pages of analysis on 7-7. And just to give you a few examples, I colour-coded this. So you see either a, um, two columns, red column and green column. Now the more red you see, the more it points, and the stronger the red colours, it points towards a hypothesis that this was an inside job. The more green you see, it points towards a hypothesis that this was as the government narrative would have us believe and that it was for Muslims that perpetrated these acts. Now, if the government were telling the truth all along and all these, and, and these are all facts, all these facts would invariably point towards the government's narrative. But as we go through some of these, you can clearly see that the opposite is the case. So, for instance, Tony Blair, with his willful abandonment of innocent until proven guilty, by saying that we will not have an inquiry, it would be a ludicrous diversion. That, to my mind, is a clear indicator of a cover-up rather than an organisation that is actually telling the truth. So you can see, um, if we just go, I'm not going to go through every one, but I'm going to show you the kind of analysis. So the next slide, I go on different themes. Next slide, please. So early failures of the police, CCT problems, and each one we're actually listing and then assessing as to which way it's pointing. Next slide, please. Right. We're talking about an Israeli link here and issues that point towards involvement of Mossad along with MI5. We've got issues regarding the Luton station and the Fiat Bravo. Now these are all facts, and it's a question of which way does the fact point towards? Which narrative does it support best? Next slide, please. Okay. So, for instance, in uh, number six, we've got power to Peter, Peter Power. Peter Power's early announcement, for instance, at half past nine this morning, we were running an exercise for a company over a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations where it happened this morning. If so, coincidence almost impossible. Interdependence between drill attacks is a near certainty. This obvious fact is ignored by all the investigation into 7-7. The chances of this happening by chance 
are probably in excess of a billion to the one. So all that alone, Peter Power admitting that there's a terror drill at the exact same locations, it is best explained by the fact that the agents of the state had planned this. And because there was a failure to investigate and, in, and actually have him in for questioning, it was ignored. That is a further indicator that it was all covered up. We'll keep going. And you get the picture. You see all the reds rather than the greens. It's absolutely slam dunker that it's an inside job. There can be no doubt. And it's time people started calling think for what it is. It's unacceptable for our government to preside over acts where we kill our own people and cover it up and refuse justice. Next slide, please. So let nobody doubt that the analysis wasn't there in front of the police's very eyes, in front of the Royal Court of Justice. And the judges, our corrupt system, wouldn't dream, wouldn't dare look at this information. Now, I just want to mention the support I've had from Muslims. And by and large, it's been absolutely phenomenal. I mentioned there, Lord Nazir Ahmed from Rotherham. He's been very supportive. Next slide, please. I've had great support from Dr Nassim in Birmingham Mosque Central. Very early doors, he came to my support and helped me continue the fight through the Employment Tribunal. Next slide, please. I don't know whether anybody knows this gentleman, but it's David Pidcock. He's um, leader of the Islamic Party of Britain up in Sheffield. He contacted me within 24 hours of learning that I'd been kicked out of the organisation for, for doing what I did, for speaking truth to power. Next slide, please. And David um, speaks fearlessly on the bogus terror threat and in an attempt to bring down the corruption within from peaceful means. And he's a very articulate gentleman and a very kind and um, passionate man about the truth. Next slide, please. And I've been shouting from the rooftops, making small videos, Ex trying my level best to expose the corruption from within. And this was based in Sheffield not so long ago in the summer when I was engaging with people on the streets and I was engaging with four police officers. Now in this particular instance when I'm confronting South Yorkshire Police I confront a Muslim police officer, an Asian police officer and the reaction I got from politely going up to him and asking him how he felt and how he felt that his employers had sacked the principal analyst who was telling the truth and how he felt as a police officer in the police service where the police service were covering up the likes of 9-11 and 7-7 and very nicely, very gently he turned around to me and, says, and smiled he says, at this moment in time I'm not allowed to say anything but he said with a smile on his face thanks for asking, thanks for asking next slide please there he is, next slide. So, wanted for questioning. If I was an analyst now, still in South Yorkshire Police, I'd make no hesitation from the information that's at my disposal to make recommendations for immediate arrest for certain individual. And certainly when we go back to Panorama, Panorama program in a year before the London bombings happened, in May the 16th, 2004, simulated almost to exactly what went on. They were, this was being pre-planned, pre-planned by people that were on the Panorama programme that were talking about how it was all going to unfold, how the BBC and the media would get control of everything, and how this was all going to be done by Muslims. But they had to get control of the media. So, let's look at who was on the programme, because every single one of them who spoke on that programme should be arrested and, asked and, and brought in for questioning, if 
we were decent, a decent police service. Next slide, please. That man should certainly have been arrested. Next slide, please. He should have been arrested for questioning. Next slide, please. Michael Bartolo. He should have been arrested for questioning. Next slide, please. He should have been, as an intelligence officer, I'd like to question him. What was he doing on the Panorama programme? What was behind the Panorama programme? Because that was a clear indicator that a year before 7-7 they were planning to do it. They were planning to blow up the London trains and blame some Muslims. They had to find the patsies. They had to pick a date. They had to make it work and they had to have the media complicit in making it all look good so you'd all be fooled. Next slide, please. She should be arrested. Next slide, please. And him, and the next one, please. And the next. And the next. And the next. And she should be arrested too. Well, sorry, no, she shouldn't be arrested. Because there's a lady who goes by the name of Seven, who spoke up against Seven Seven. She actually um, went before the events occurred to the police service at Paddington Green and asked them to do something about the fact that they were giving her at least clear messages that they were about to do something dreadful on the London Underground. Now what gave a reason to do that is largely academic, but at this stage, but the very fact that she did do that and tried to get a court injunction to stop them doing it should at the very least have been investigated. The very fact that it wasn't and the very fact that she subsequently felt the need to go into hiding at the time of the London bombings means that what this lady has is by, by way of insight could, be, could have been and still is very useful in terms of giving some indication as to who might have been behind the London bombings. Next slide please. Miss Charles Seven, she may well be here. I am here. Okay. That man should have been arrested. He should have been arrested long before the 7-7 seven -seven bombings. But that happened, that photograph there is in, I think it was 30th of June 2007. He should have been arrested as a criminal long before 7-7. Seven -seven. So here we have a media mogul, first on the scene at the Glasgow airport terrorist attack. He just so happened to be the number one person who'd stole a whole host of work from Seven, Miss Seven, in 2003. Next slide please. And here's how it works. Here's a clue as to how the media get involved in all of these things. Because on the day of the terror attacks at Glasgow, that they were involved in the conning out of some of the concepts that Miss Seven had gone to them for protection for to fight a legal case against entities that had stolen some of her information, some of her products that were valuable. So this should have been arrested. Now next slide please. And one of the, they, they, they put up a terrorism website. They've supposedly represented people who've been subject to allegations of terrorism. Next slide, please. And one of their main lawyers, one of their main lawyers, who was at the front of stealing the work from Miss Seven, is none other than Tams Allen, Tams, Tams, Tams Allen, who works for Bindsman. Now, instead of being arrested for theft of intellectual property, long before 7-7, seven, seven, what happens to Tams and Allen? She gets promoted in. She gets seconded onto the Leveson inquiry. And the Leveson inquiry is all about what? Hacking of computers, listening in, intrusion. The very thing that was happening to the families of the 7-7 seven, seven victims. The very thing that has been happening to Seven. What did he do to a corrupt lawyer who's stolen all the works for her? And this is provable. As an intelligence analyst and looked at that particular case, she should have been arrested. And look at the organisation, look at the programme that's 
showing her panorama. Panorama is unfit for purpose. That should have, as an organisation, been investigated the bias coverage of these terrorist attacks. Next try, please. The fast track for promotion. We just have to stand back and look at what's happened here. And people involved in the London bombings, in telling lies, in the assassination of Jean Charles de Menzies, proven liars have been fast tracked for promotion. Lady Justice Hallett, as a judge, broke all the rules of the game in terms of the inquiry into the London bombings by saying that the four lads were guilty when we've never had those four lads proven guilty in a court of law. And Lady, Lady Dame Janet Smith is the judge that's now going to be presiding over the Jimmy Savile case. She was the judge that, who in the Royal Court of Justice closed down my particular case where all the analysis of 7-7 was before the Royal Court of Justice. She went to the, the lies of saying that she didn't think it was genuine, when all the judges before had always said that it was genuine, and the police service, even in dismissing me, has always said it was genuine. So she's corrupt. She was on a job to cover the whole thing up. Where can you get justice? And the other one, my chief constable, my former chief constable, Meredith Hughes, he had the job of covering up 7-7 afterwards. He had the job, he was up at Glen Eagles on the day of 7-7 looking after Tony Blair and George Bush. What happens to him? He gets a QPM. An early retirement, one year for his good deeds, for his dirty deeds. Next slide please. So I've spoke about the matrix that I've been in. I've showed you the matrix system. Now, I mentioned some of the clues that Miss Seven might have had, the prior insight that, at least in her mind, led her to go to warn the authorities that 7-7 was taking place. And I just, without going into the details, the Matrix system and the film The Matrix and the Wachowski brothers who put out V for Vendetta which was featured just before, in adverts, before the London bombings, was called that Seven, Miss Seven, saw sufficiently to be threatening to alert the authorities who took no notice. And it wasn't just that, there were other signals too. So this matrix construct that we've been through is worthy of further investigation. Next slide, please. That was all happening, advertised, in the month before the London bombings. And certainly, with, what, with the ordeal that Miss Seven had been through, she was seeing this as something sinister and something worthy of going to the police for and going to the courts to say, stop them from blowing up the underground. And she can prove that she did that. Next slide, please. She had other information that was given her vital clues that the media moguls was somehow had prior knowledge that 7-7 was going to happen and were advertising it hidden in plain sight. Next slide please. So we've got four lads who've been blamed, innocent, assassinated and we've got traitors and liars who've been promoted and that's Britain, that's Police State UK. Next slide, please. So those, just, I'll just finish this last couple of slides. I just want you to know that there's plenty of information that you can view. Google Collistrum and Farrell are dead, and you can see a satire on what really happened. Pick up Terry on the Tube as a book with new Nick Collistrum. I re fully recommend that writing. It gives brilliant insight into what may have happened. And next slide, please. And I finally want to give a plug for this gentleman here who's made a very brave stance against the BBC and he's made a couple of films that are worthy of watching. That one of them was, part of them was going to be shown today which would have been offensive, the story of Tony Farrell, which isn't really about the story of Tony Farrell, it's about 
the injustice and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and a call for action from all faiths and none. He's particularly critical of the Christian faith. He's particularly Christian, critical of the Christian faith for not adhering to the teachings of Jesus and actually calling 7-7 seven, seven for what it is. And he says we owe the Muslims an apology. And I can go along with that. That we, that the Christ, you know, being a Christian myself, I despair with the, perhaps the indifference uh, that is around in the Christian faith. But I will say one thing. It doesn't help. It doesn't help because at the moment there isn't a strong enough voice coming from the Muslim community that is telling our government, that is telling everybody that, hold on a minute, why do you keep blaming us when we didn't do it? It's not right for us to be blamed. Because it's my belief that if Muslims collectively said that in inequalitable terms and said that we're not having any more of this, we do not accept that we did it, we did not do 9-11, we did not 7-7, would you please stop demonising us on this putrid strategy? That would have an incredible effect on the people of Christian faith. Because if you start to defend yourself, they'll say, they'll start to think maybe there is something in this. Maybe there is a massive injustice. But until they hear that voice coming from the Muslim community, they are not of a mindset where they can suddenly switch and say there's been an injustice. They don't want to know that our country is as bad as it is. But this is where we can unite in truth, we can say against an evil force that we can't tolerate any more of this. We've got to move forward in a spirit of truth, justice, love and peace. And that there is no room for any of this anymore. And if there's one thing I would implore is that Muslims throughout the length and breadth of this country take a look at 9-11 and 7-7, collectively consider as a voice what they can do. I came from a police force that for 23 years lied about Hillsborough. And I saw Justice for 96 campaign topple, topple the lies of South Yorkshire Police. And I want Justice for 96, Justice for 56, to, to come for the, to be for the government what Justice for 96 came, became for South Yorkshire Police. And if they could raise 140,000 petitioners that spoke out against the injustice of Hillsborough, how many voices can be heard collectively from Muslims that talk about the injustice that has been perpetrated? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much. And a real eye opener to all those people there who, who think that the police service in this country are there to protect us. And I'd like to qualify that statement because we have a very good relationship with the local police force. We have uh, members from our community that work there. We're not, I think Tony is not accusing people, you know, your general Bobby on the street. Or not at all. Low level. This goes to a very high level here. So don't assume automatically that every police officer you see is part of this, this cover-up. This comes from a very high level. And uh, unfortunately, if you stand up for it, your principles, as Tony did, um, you pay for it ultimately by losing your job. Um, it was a very, very interesting speech. Um, unfortunately, the Imran Hussain uh, speech, we've had to cancel that. And it seems to me some mischief going on there with the network because uh, we've never had those kinds of problems before. But maybe we'll pre-record his speech and, and do that another time. What I'd like to do now, though, is invite people um, who have any questions to maybe come forward and uh, put your questions directly to Yes. My name is Zulkar. And uh, the uh, the Lundi it's a question is uh, kind of an answer to your question that you said that if you guys come together and raise a voice, uh, it might make, make, make an impact. That's what you said, isn't it? I think in certain areas it, it would make an impact because we've got to move forward in the spirit of truth. Now, 
can, can, can we have a show of hands? Who, who, who believes that Muslims did it? 7-7. Seven, seven. So none of you believe it. So you're all really convinced that it's an inside job. So I think it, 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 irrespective of what, what can be done, is it not right to come to the defence and, and, and try and stop this injustice? Uh, what I would like to point out to is the orchestrated uh, uh, way they work. They, the way the media is working, as you would agree, is uh, they would portray somebody in a demonized fashion. Yeah. And the way they do that, uh, I, I, I hope you will agree with me, is uh, if there's an event to brainwash the people, what they do is they show that clip over and over again, so that at the end of the day, people start believing what they what they are saying. Is that right? That's right. When people like yourselves, I've been through that uh, process as well. Uh, try to raise your voice, then see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is one uh, one effect of uh, raising a voice. People have been uh, suppressed so much that uh, by fear they said just keep quiet, otherwise. Otherwise, we'd be, you know, in trouble, and that's the reason why people are not coming together. Fully understand. Yeah. Uh, I hope you understand that. I do understand. Okay. Yes. Now the other question is, uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, it's nice of you to come to a forum like this and say that uh, you know Muslims are being uh, targeted and uh, they are uh, uh, they are being facing injustice. It's nice, and everybody over here in this forum will agree that yes, that is the truth. What I want to know is, uh, what uh, you guys are doing a very good job, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, how do we educate the people outside? Uh, any Tom, Dick, and you can just stop on the street and ask him about uh, all what he said. He is going to say Muslims did 9-11, Muslims did 9 7 how, uh, how is it possible to educate those people uh, in a situation like this where the media is telling them something and the fact is something else? Now. I'm yeah. sorry, my, my question is getting a bit... Uh, no, I can understand where you're coming but, from. Uh, but uh, I'm telling you what I've seen. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if from memory, what I remember, when 977 happened, from memory I remember, vaguely, uh, Tony Blair was being grilled on an issue during that time. And I suspect, to diverge uh, the attention of people, uh, I think this happened. I don't know how to answer. I'm sorry, I just want to get his contact, please. Have contact, please. That's right, yeah. Really have, you got, have you got a pen? My I'll, pen. I'll give it. Yeah? yeah. Right. You just answer. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to address that question by giving the experience of working within the truth movement for a couple of years. Because you're right, it's not easy. It's not easy to wake people up. It's not easy. People have a reaction to what you're saying and perhaps they don't want to believe it's true. And I think that there is an opportunity through alternative media. There is an opportunity through your networks within the mosques to contact. So for instance, hearing a white Christian come to the defense of Muslims in a mosque is something that I think would be worthwhile showing the length and breadth of this country in the mosques. Because we've got to try and get to a tipping point where there's critical mass and that people are free in their hearts and minds to speak the truth and to live without the fear that if you speak out you're going to get police state UK on your backs. And I think there's an opportunity to win through speaking truth, to win the hearts and minds of the British public. Muslims who, are perhaps some Muslims, that maybe they're not true Muslims, but claim credit for the attacks of 9-11 and 7-7, I don't believe um, can help the cause. I believe it's only through speaking truth speaking truth at every angle that really can heal what's going on in our nation and that 
I despair as a Christian and going into church and, and seeing the reaction of Christians when I try and tell them what's going on in the country and I get that glazed look over the face. I, want, I don't want that glazed look. I want them to see the injustice. I want them to come to the help of the Muslims and saying, all oh, once great nations shouldn't be demonizing you the way they did. It's totally, totally and utterly wrong. And I do believe that if you did somehow collectively speak up, that you would get a very favorable reaction and you would help the Christian church too wake up and stand against this new world order, which does follow a satanic ideology. Any other questions? Do you want to come over and just put a question in there? Right, as uh, you were saying that um, these satanic new world order and Illuminati and all their organizations, they are over control of money and they are over control of their banks and uh, the power of the military all over the world. It's not only London bombing and it's not only the 9-11, September 9-11 and it's all going on all over the world. They are behind all governments mm -hmm. around the world, in the Middle East, in Asia, South Asia, in Europe, in America, all over the world. And uh, as I was previously asked one of your colleagues, I said, how would we be able to stand up and, I mean, your voice and our voice can be, as like, compared to their power, the power of money and the power of uh, the banks and the power of the... Uh, the plans they have drawn since the beginning of the 21st of century until, until now. Our voice compared to them, their, their power is like a drop in the ocean. How would we be able to stand against them? Because they got the control of money. And if they got the control of money, what they can do, they can buy anyone they want. I mean, like, as previously you mentioned that one of the police officers, you asked him, what do you think about this whole old plans and games going on. He said, I, I'm not allowed to speak up. I'm not allowed to say, I'm, as he said, he can't say anything because he you knows if he said anything, he would be, uh, he would be out of the job. He would be, uh, I mean, a lot of people has been bought by them. So yeah. how can we control something yeah. when we have no money, what they do have? They okay. have to have the control of everything. Okay. It's a difficult one, but I would say look towards your faith. Look towards the Muslim faith. Look towards your scripture in the Quran. Just as I would look towards the Holy Scripture in the Bible and seek my answers there. Because what does, when you see evil, what does the Quran tell you to do? Stand up against it. Stand up against it. That's exactly the same as the Christian script, Holy Scripture in the Bible tells us to do. Not to turn a blind eye. Ephesians 5.11 tells, have nothing to do with the fruitless words of darkness, but rather come out and expose. And I think there has got to be a spiritual awakening. And that there are more people that essentially will be good than are evil. And then, if you use that spiritual sense and that you turn towards your scripture, then the answer lies there. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we have some refreshments and uh, you have an opportunity to mingle with other questions. You have questions? Yes. Could you come forward? I don't think it needs longer. Um, Tony, we have massive evidence in the event of 9-11 for Israeli Mossad involvement in the event. Do you think there's anything congruent with European terror events like the London bombing? Do you think there's any evidence for Israeli Mossad involvement in this? Well, I think... As you demonstrated in Colossum and Farrell are dead, Nick, so uh, capably, we do have a Mossad involvement in 7-7. We did have um, prior knowledge. We did have Benjamin Netanyahu in London 
on the day of London bombings. And he was given prior warnings that something was going to happen. So much so that he changed his plans on the morning of 7-7. We have Israeli companies running the underground. We have Israeli companies looking at CCTV systems, Varen systems. We have Israeli control of a lot of areas associated with security. So yes, I do believe that there is MI and Mossad involvement in some way or other. Not in splendid isolation, but to some degree, you know, MI5 and in connection with Mossad and, and the media industry. So most certainly, Nick, there is involvement in your, and, and, and anybody who really needs to know more on that, I would fully recommend you to get hold of Nick's excellent work, either through the website on Terror on the Tube, or on his uh, book, Terror on the Tube, Beneath the Veil of 7-7. Thanks. So no, no questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah, there's one last, last question. No, after, after this, if you come forward. It's just, I think, maybe of interest to in the audience here, okay? That's, that's just, just to add what Tony said, uh, there was an article in the Jerusalem Post about 2 o'clock that day, at 7 7, uh, written by the head of Mossad about the London bombings, and it had quite obviously been written before, quite obviously been planned long before by that article, for rules for engaging in the Third World War. Um, and and uh, that came out, I obviously knew too much about the London bombings. Uh, and in my book I didn't emphasise very much, but it would be a main, uh, main aspect of the influence of the Israeli and Mossad connection of this event. Okay, thank you. Now, the, the question basically is, I mean, if this is happening, why isn't the other country saying it's an inside job and like all, it seems like all the other countries in the world are accepting it and uh, it's just like yeah. yourselves and yeah but no other countries come out and said well we don't it's an inside job you, you know you sort yourself out nothing to do with us I mean Saudi and all the other people yeah. they accepted it you know I mean no other country no Muslim country come out and said no we don't believe that I mean has anybody said that it's always in Iran yeah wow oh my god Iran is like you know like yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's taking side, I mean, it's some sort of conspiracy game everywhere. Yeah, I mean, see, I mean, it's Iran. I mean, why did the other Muslim countries say, no, we don't believe that, it's inside job is to do... Brother, can I just say something? Yes. What's happening in Bangladesh? Yes. How many Muslim countries that condemned it? None of them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The thing is, there is corruption everywhere, and the problem is the Muslims are being targeted, and they're the ones who are being blamed. And the media is controlled. Yeah, but the thing is, the problem with Muslim now, we blame the other guys. It's always the others. If you, if you look at Sorry, uh, Bangladesh, there's no America going in there saying, you know, like we need to sort you out. If you look at 9 11, everybody knows completely what's happened. They were detonated, the buildings were detonated. Building number five didn't even get hit by a missile, it fell by itself. It's a Having it so controlled demolition. No, listen, I'm, what I'm not happy, I'm saying, why isn't there one country coming out except Iran to say to them, look, this is the inside job. It's nothing to do with Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. Because most people listen to the news.